Welcome everyone to my channel, I'm Anime Kingdom. Today, we're going to summarize the entire anime series Dr. Stone, from season 1 to season 3. This anime is about a teenager named Ishigami Senku, who loves science. For some reason, a mysterious green light turned the world into stone, making modern civilization return to primitive life. 3,700 years later, Ishigami Senku revived. He used the power of science, and knowledge to rebuild a scientific civilization to save all the people, who were turned into stone on Earth. The student Taiju tells his friend Senku that he will confess his love for user Aha, whom he has secretly loved for five years. Senku says that he has just created a love potion that can help with a successful confession, but it's actually just gasoline. Taiju decides to confess on his own and pours the liquid away. Underneath the tree, as the two friends are about to confess their feelings, a sudden green light appears, engulfing the entire earth and turning all humans to stone. They remain conscious, but their bodies have turned to stone, and the world without humans gradually decays and crumbles. Several decades passed, and the stone shell surrounding Taiju's body cracked open. The first thing he did upon waking up was to search for his friend user Aha, who had now become a stone statue. Taiju's confession had become meaningless. Surprisingly, there was a message on a tree trunk telling him to go downstream, where he found Senku. It had been 3,700 years since the incident, with each second counted by Senku throughout the years. Somehow, Senku had broken free from the stone half a year earlier. In that time, he had built a place to store food and conduct small experiments to bring humans back to life. Senku believed that his friend would survive, and now, one person using brains and another using muscle, they worked together to rebuild the world. They compared themselves to Adam and Eve of the petrified world, aiming to revive humanity. Taiju began searching for food while Senku took charge of categorizing it. At the place where Taiju revived, Senku collected nitric acid, a substance produced by bats, and used it to experiment with dissolving the stone layers covering a bird, but the results were still not promising. After many experiments, Senku figured out that they needed a bit of alcohol to create a reaction equation to produce night LH, a corrosive solvent. Taiju collected some grapes from the forest, so now they could make alcohol. After some time distilling, they made alcohol and created night LH. They started experimenting on the bird's stone layer, and this time they succeeded. Senku gave Taiju the right to decide who would be revived next, and of course, he chose Yuzuraha. When preparing to revive Yuzuraha, Taiju suddenly realized that when the stone layer cracked, Yuzuraha would have nothing on her body. So Taiju decided to take Yuzuraha back to their dwelling to dress her before saving her. Suddenly, a group of lions appeared and chased them. To save Senku, Taiju wanted to stay behind alone, but Senku wanted someone as capable as him to rebuild civilization together. Instead of saving Yuzuraha, they decided to save someone strong first, and that person was Shishio Tsukasa. When Senku woke up, he immediately announced the enemy's information and location. Tsukasa instantly rushed over and punched the male lion down, and they now had someone to take on the role of a fighter. Tsukasa also took responsibility for finding food for everyone. Senku used the aldehyde in the smoke to kill bacteria in the food, and it also helped preserve the food for longer. The next thing Senku needed was calcium carbonate, limestone. With Senku's knowledge, they could create limestone from seashells by grinding them. Taiju took on the task of collecting and crushing them. There were four ways to use them. 1. In agriculture, 2. In construction, by heating and mixing with sand to get mortar, which is crude cement, 3. Mixing oil with calcium carbonate and seaweed to create soap, helping all three clean their bodies. With such extensive knowledge, Tsukasa praised Senku. He also guessed that Senku had some plans he hadn't revealed yet, so he only mentioned three uses. The next day, Tsukasa revealed his thoughts through a story about a boy who wanted to collect seashells as a gift to help his little sister recover from an illness quickly. However, a drunk man stopped him, claiming that it could be considered stealing, and so the boy couldn't make the gift for his sister. Tsukasa wanted Senku to only revive young people with pure hearts. He also smashed a stone statue, effectively killing a person. Senku said he would use science to save everyone without leaving anyone behind. Faced with Tsukasa's frightening ideal, fortunately, he didn't know the secret of the cave yet. Just then, Taiju arrived, announcing that he had obtained the miracle water to save Yuzuraha. Senku had no choice but to tell Tsukasa about the location of the liquid in the cave. While Tsukasa was away, Senku quickly made Night LH to save Yuzuraha. Senku presented two options for Taiju and Yuzuraha, one, they go somewhere to live, or two, they stay and fight against Tsukasa. 
who had returned. Taiju rushed to attack, and Sanku reluctantly used the weapon he had created to prevent the battle, but Sukasa caught it and threw the arrow away. He also dealt a blow to Taiju, but he managed to block it. Taiju was the first person to block an attack from Sukasa. Taiju allowed Sukasa to hit him on the condition that he would not destroy any more statues. Unexpectedly, Taiju collapsed unconscious. Senku said that Taiju needed a few days of rest to recover. Sukasa turned and left to pursue his ideals. Senku woke Taiju up, and they needed to advance in civilization and scientific weaponry to stop Sukasa. They created a fake scene to mislead Sukasa into thinking that they had desperately fled. They decided to go to Hakane to find materials for making weapons. Along the way, Senku found a sextant, which could calculate positions based on time, but something was off with the time calculation. Soon after, Yuzuraha discovered a Buddha statue, and they rejoiced because they now knew their exact location. On the other side, following the traces left by Senku, Tsukasa learned about their plan to create scientific weapons to oppose him. They arrived at a hot spring, which was also the place to create the scientific weapon Senku mentioned, a gun. They would create gunpowder from the sulfur found in the area. Tsukasa also guessed Senku's plan to make a gun, and he needed to stop him. Taiju and Yuzuraha bathed together in the hot spring. 3,700 years ago, Taiju didn't have the chance to express his feelings. After waking up in this new era, saving humanity was the most crucial thing for Taiju, so he still couldn't confess his love to Yuzuraha. The three main ingredients, charcoal, sulfur, and potassium nitrate, were prepared. Senku created potassium nitrate from nitric acid, mixed it with sulfur and charcoal, and added some sugar to increase firepower. Finally, they pounded it hard to compress it. Hearing that strength was needed, Taiju eagerly brought a large rock. However, right after that, there was an explosion, throwing them far away. The explosion created a sudden plume of smoke. A white smoke column was their signal, but if it were Tsukasa, he would never reveal his location. They realized that there might be other people besides themselves in this world. They decided to create three explosions to see if anyone would respond to their signal. Unfortunately, Tsukasa caught up with them and captured Yuzuraha, threatening Senku. He wanted Senku to give him the formula to reverse petrification because if Senku restored the previous civilization, war would break out. Senku cared for his friends, so he revealed the entire formula, the proportions and components of the petrification cure. Even though Yuzuraha had volunteered to die so Senku could keep the secret from Tsukasa. Even after revealing the secret, Tsukasa still wanted to kill Senku. He told Senku that if he gave up his scientific research, he wouldn't kill him. However, since he was young, Senku couldn't give up on science. Meanwhile, Taiju, who was collecting firewood, sensed the danger and hurried back. Tsukasa approached Senku, intending to finish him off with a blow to his neck. When Taiju arrived, Senku was already lying motionless. Taiju was furious that Tsukasa had killed Senku. Taiju and Yuzuraha teamed up. Taiju threw a rock into the air while Yuzuraha ran towards Tsukasa and threw the jar of gunpowder that Senku had left behind at him. Tsukasa's kick broke the jar, causing the gunpowder to scatter all over the ground. At the same time, the rock fell and created a spark, causing an explosion. Yuzuraha and Taiju took advantage of the chaos to grab Senku and run away. They tried their best to save their friend, but Tsukasa was certain he had broken Senku's neck. In the past, when asked to choose between saving himself, his friends, or his lover, Senku always found a way to save everyone. Taiju believed that Senku had left them a clue or some hint. Yuzuraha remembered that Senku had been repeatedly cracking his neck joints to draw Tsukasa's attention and make him target his neck. When they turned Senku's body over, they found a layer of petrification on the back of his neck. Taiju recalled that Senku had mentioned that minor injuries could be healed upon breaking free from petrification. This could potentially help Senku's neck bones reattach. They poured the petrification cure on the petrified area on the back of Senku's neck and prayed for a miracle to happen. Before Senku came back to life, he accidentally came into contact with nitric acid and revived, but it didn't work when he used it on others. Senku guessed it was because his brain had been active by counting time for 3,700 years. Senku kept experimenting, but with his brain, he needed physical strength to do everything. So Taiju was the friend he needed. The two trusted each other, and Taiju's efforts brought Senku back. They were happy that Senku had returned. And the wound on his neck had fully recovered. Senku asked Yuzuraha and Taiju to go back to Tsukasa. Join him and become spies in Tsukasa's empire. 
The news of Senku's death was an opportunity for him to hide and build an empire to fight against Sakasa's empire using a science army. Taiju just needed to protect Yuzuraha well. The three of them said goodbye in silence. Sakasa encountered a strange girl who had witnessed the entire process of him killing Senku. They both started fighting, and Sakasa realized that she knew nothing about science. Perhaps she had grown up in this era. He needed to quickly return to the cave to collect the miracle water before Taiju and Yuzuraha. So he ruthlessly knocked down a tree to pin the girl down. Senku immediately ran to her rescue. She recognized him as the one who was killed by Tsukasa earlier. With limited time and lacking physical strength, Senku used leverage to lift the tree trunk without much effort. Kohaku led Senku to her village. And on the way, she fetched some hot water to treat her sister's illness. Senku created a sliding cart to help them travel faster. In front of them was Kohaku's village. With over 40 people, some people had escaped from being petrified before them. And these people were the descendants of that person. However, these people probably hadn't been taught any science, so the village was still in a primitive state. As Senku approached the bridge, he was attacked by two people who didn't allow him to pass. But luckily Kohaku stopped them. The village rules forbade outsiders from entering, and despite Kohaku insisting that Senku was her benefactor, they still wouldn't let him in. Seeing that the two attackers didn't know anything about science, Senku created soap bubbles to test them. They thought it was magic and tried to attack the bubbles. A magician from the village named Chrome appeared, claiming to be a genius in magic and knowing how to create soap bubbles. Chrome challenged Senku to a magic duel by throwing salt, sulfur, and copper sulfate into the fire to change its color. Senku analyzed each substance that Chrome had added, and seeing that Senku wasn't scared, Chrome ran to fetch a sulfur ball. When rubbed, it would create an electric current, which he then used to charge his body and transfer electricity to someone else. Senku saw that Chrome shared his passion for exploring and discovering things, even if he didn't know what they were, and this was the perfect place for him to build his kingdom of science. The two were excited to learn from each other. Senku melted some cinnabar to create mercury, which he mixed with gold powder to create a gold-coated spear for Kinro. That night, Senku told Chrome the truth about the world, explaining that 3,700 years ago, humanity had advanced civilizations, but one day, a beam of green light turned everyone into stone, leading to the current situation. All of civilization's knowledge now resided in Senku's mind. Senku invited Chrome to join his kingdom of science and use their scientific knowledge to create antibiotics to save Ruri. The villagers and the village chief were suspicious of Senku, considering him an outsider who could pose a threat to their village. Meanwhile, Senku, Kohaku, and Chrome worked together to create antibiotics, requiring minerals and living organisms. Chrome discovered a type of rock that always pointed north when floating on water. Senku explained that it was a magnet that could be used to create iron. The next day, they went to a stream where they met a young girl wearing a watermelon on her head named Suika, who wanted to help them. Senku was also curious about Ruri and her stories about people from long ago. Using the magnetic rock, they obtained iron powder, which they mixed with charcoal and heated to 1500 degrees Celsius. They used Senku's blower device to increase the temperature, but the next morning, the iron powder remained unchanged. They needed more manpower, so to persuade the villagers, Senku assigned Suika the task of entering the village to find out what people wanted. Suika heard many things during her time in the village. And when she returned that night, she told them about the villagers' desires. First, three girls wanted boyfriends, which Senku's science couldn't provide. Next, a young boy was tired of eating fish, and Senku's science could help with this issue. They found a plant called foxtail, which Senku crushed, cooked, and ground into a powder to create foxtail flour, then softened it with potassium carbonate. This led to the creation of a dish called ramen. Although it wasn't the same as traditional ramen made with wheat flour, it was attractive to the villagers. They opened a ramen cart outside the village, trading ramen for the help they needed with their iron smelting. The ramen attracted several villagers, and everyone was captivated by Senku's creation. Suddenly, a strange man appeared, ate the ramen, and demanded a drink called coca. Senku realized he was a magician and author of some trashy psychology books by Asagiri General he had just escaped petrification and belonged to Tsukasa's empire. Everyone who ate Senku's ramen had to work in his forge. With their strength, Senku successfully melted iron and made an iron bar. Jen's task was to confirm if Senku was really dead. Despite what Senku had done, Jen couldn't decide which side was better. 
Senku said he was preparing to make a generator, which amazed General Chrome also collected copper. They needed to create copper wires to wrap around the iron bar and build a lightning rod to turn it into a magnet. As rain approached, they hurriedly prepared. When some villagers saw Senku taking wooden planks from a bridge to create a mold for the copper wire, they thought he was destroying the village and went out to confront him. Jen stepped in and performed a few magic tricks, explaining that they were casting a spell to ward off lightning. The villagers reluctantly returned to their village. The group went to a high mountain, where they needed something long to connect to the ground. Kohaka found Kenro and borrowed his spear to use as a grounding rod. Lightning struck from the sky, and they successfully obtained a magnet. What Senku was creating was a human-powered generator. Copper was flattened and ground using ultra-hard corundum, second only to diamonds. The double-handle hand crank generator was born. They needed two people with equal strength to operate it, and no one was more suitable than Kenro and Jinro. Although Jen continually refused due to the village rules, he mentioned the possibility of creating golden and silver spears, which enticed Kenro and Jinro to join them. A civilization that had been dormant for 3,700 years was reignited. The Edison light bulb, which Edison had invented to help humanity defeat darkness, was lit, illuminating a vast area. The light symbolized hope and the power of science, showing the villagers that they were on the path to a brighter future. The group discussed their concerns about Jen's loyalty since he was a member of Tsukasa's empire. Meanwhile, Jen was ambushed by a mysterious attacker who relentlessly assaulted him, eventually delivering a seemingly fatal blow. When the others rushed to his aid, they found Jen unconscious and covered in blood. Fortunately, he had prepared a few fake blood pouches on his body, which saved him from the attacker's lethal blows. They brought him inside to tend to his wounds. Suika investigated the incident and discovered that the attacker was Magma. He had previously seen Jen perform magic tricks and assumed that Jen was a sorcerer brought by Kohaku to the village. Magma's primary motive was to eliminate strong opponents so that he could win the upcoming martial arts tournament, marry Rory, and become the village chief. Kohaku had previously defeated Magma in combat, because she knew he was a bad person, but village rules prevented her from marrying Rory. Therefore, the tournament was rescheduled for the following month. To prevent her sister from falling into Magma's hands, Kohaku trained Kenru and Jinra for them to participate in a competition. Although Chrome loved Rory very much, he knew he could only help her with science by making antibiotics for her. The next morning, Jen ran away, and everyone was worried that he would tell Tsukasa about Senku still being alive. Kohaku wanted to chase after him, but Senku stopped her, trusting that Jen would not reveal the truth because he had already chosen a side since Senku created the electric light. The night before, Jen and Senku had a conversation in which Jen wanted Senku to make cold Coca-Cola in this era as a promise between them. Jen told Sakasa that he only saw and was attacked by a primitive village, with no traces of Senku. The next thing they needed to do was to make glass to create chemicals conveniently for the process of making antibiotics, and it would also help little Suika, who was nearsighted. Senku promised Suika he would help her see clearly again. To make glass, they needed to find a type of sand called silica sand, then calcium carbonate, and lead to melt and form a round block. Through the corundum grinding machine, it was slowly ground thin. Senku took Suika to a sunflower field and let her try on the glasses. She was truly overjoyed because, for the first time, she could see everything clearly. They began to heat the glass bottles, using the bubbles as insulation to create a glass furnace and made a blowpipe from iron to start shaping the glass. However, they couldn't shape it properly and needed a craftsman for the job. Chrome brought out old man Keisuke to ask for help, but he refused to assist them. Senku and Chrome kept trying to provoke Keisuke into action. Keisuke's meticulous work helped create a laboratory for Senku. Reiner who always lost to Kohaku, and his vision was also blurry like Suika's, but being a boy, he didn't use that as an excuse. Jinru and Reiner who asked Senku to make them gold and silver-coated spears to boost their confidence in battle. Senku decided to make a silver-coated spear for Jinru first. Senku made a silver spear for Jinru. However, he had an ulterior motive as the search for materials to create antibiotics this time was extremely dangerous. Senku instructed Jinru that if the spear turned black, he must return immediately, even a 0.1 second delay would result in their death. They went to a lake containing hydrogen sulfide and sulfur dioxide, which are heavier than air, so when the silver came into contact, it turned black due to the reaction with hydrogen sulfide. Jinru was captivated by the lake's beauty and kept moving forward even though the spear had turned black. Senku shouted loudly, and fortunately, Kohaku pulled Jinru back just in time. 
The sight of birds dying on the spot after inhaling the toxic gas terrified them. The chemical that had become the backbone of modern chemical industry was sulfuric acid, which was essential for them to conduct experiments to save Rory. Kohaku wanted to retrieve it herself, even if it meant dying, but Senku stopped her, he told her about scientists who had tried to obtain it before, but they died instantly from just one breath of the toxic gas. They needed to create a gas mask, and since this task could be life-threatening, Senku wanted to go himself and asked Chrome to stay behind. He planned to pass on all his scientific knowledge from 2 million years to Chrome, but Chrome refused, insisting that if someone were to die, it should be him or someone else. With Chrome's determination and the mutual trust they had for each other, like Senku had for Taiju and user Aha, Senku decided to make another gas mask. Rory, Kohaku's sister and the village's priestess, was expected to inherit 100 stories about knowledge. Since Rory was ill, her father wanted her to inherit her sister's knowledge. However, Kohaku refused, trying to find a way to heal her sister. She tried to become detestable in her father's eyes to avoid inheriting her sister's knowledge. Chrome truly deserves to be with Rory, but according to the rules, if Jinru or Reiner win, they will marry Rory. If that were to happen, Kohaku would take her sister's place and marry Chrome. However, he refused because he didn't want to marry a gorilla, and he got a swollen head from being kicked by her. The gas masks were made using activated charcoal and potassium carbonate, which could filter out toxins. Senku and Chrome went together to obtain sulfuric acid. Upon arrival, although Senku helped Chrome calm down, he himself was still trembling. On the other side, Jinru was also scared and didn't understand why they knew it was dangerous but still insisted on going. Old man Keisuke said that nobody is without fear, but they try to overcome their fears to protect what they cherish. This made Jinru more determined. Keisuke had made an extra gas mask, and Jinru arrived just in time to save Chrome when he tripped and almost fell into the sulfuric acid lake. In the end, they successfully obtained the sulfuric acid. Senku's group had returned with the hardest to find ingredient, sulfuric acid. While they had almost all the other ingredients, which were somewhat complicated, they now just needed to carry out the reactions for their experiments. First, they heated sulfuric acid, adding salt to obtain hydrochloric acid, which is dangerous if it splashes into the eyes and can cause blindness. Next, they heated sulfur from the sulfuric acid lake and led the gas into a container with hydrochloric acid to obtain chlorosulfuric acid, a dangerous substance that can turn skin into a frighteningly lifeless state if it comes into contact. Afterward, they electrolyzed salt water to obtain sodium hydroxide, an extremely dangerous substance capable of dissolving corpses. The next chemical was ammonia. They were almost done, needing only three more ingredients and some alcohol. Old man Keisuke mentioned that at tomorrow's competition, the winner would be rewarded with unlimited alcohol. Senku's name was added to the list of competitors, and their plan was to wear down their opponents, especially Magma, so Kenru could easily defeat him in the final match. The day of the competition arrived, and for the first time in half a year, Senku stepped into the village, as outsiders were not prohibited from participating. When Rory heard Senku's name, she felt like she had known him for a long time, but as she approached to ask about his family name, she suddenly fell ill and collapsed. You were not allowed to approach her and ask questions either. They began drawing lots to participate in the competition and made a plan to wear down their opponents so that Kohaku and Kenru could face Magma in the finals. However, Magma and Kenru met in the first match. Unexpectedly, one of Magma's teammates ran over and told them that Suika was drowning. Senku and Chrome knew he was lying, but Kohaku wanted to go ensure Suika's safety. If Kohaku didn't return in time, she would lose her right to compete. The first match between Magma and Kenru began, with Kenru fiercely attacking Magma. Surprisingly, Magma kept his distance from Kenru, making it difficult for Kenru's blurry vision to see clearly. At that moment, Suika returned after being tied to a tree by Magma's teammate. She observed that Kenru's vision was as blurry as hers. Due to his poor eyesight, Kenru was directly attacked by Magma, leaving him motionless. Suika threw her science glasses to Kenru, who caught them and put them on. Now able to see clearly, he easily dodged Magma's attacks and proved to be much stronger than Magma. With Suika's glasses on, Kenru easily attacked and defeated Magma. However, realizing he couldn't beat Kenru, Magma resorted to dirty tactics. He told Kenru to ask the referee if wearing the glasses was against the rules, and if not, he would accept defeat. As Kenru turned to ask the referee, Magma sneakily attacked him, knocking Kenru unconscious and winning the match. 
Next was Chrome's match against Magmas Jr. Magma saw Kohaku running back from a distance and instructed his junior to forfeit immediately, as he knew he wouldn't have the strength to fight Kohaku. Since Kohaku was absent, she lost by default, and Senku was declared the winner. Suika blamed herself for Kohaku's inability to participate, but Kohaku assured her that as long as she was okay, that was enough. Now, the Kingdom of Science's team could only rely on Jinru. In the match, Jinru fought with great enthusiasm, having consumed nutritious food like honey, herbs, and caffeine before the competition. He then pushed his opponent off a cliff and claimed victory. The next match was the semi-final between Chrome and Magma. Despite the significant power difference, Magma kept attacking Chrome, trying to make him admit defeat. However, because of his feelings for Rory and the people of the Kingdom of Science, Chrome remained determined. His plan was to use Suika's glasses to create fire to burn Magma. Senku realized Chrome misunderstood lenses. A magnifying glass for starting a fire is a converging lens, while Suika's glasses were diverging lenses that scatter light. Thus, Chrome's plan wouldn't work. Being a scientist, Chrome used his sweat and tears to create a converging lens. Senku calculated the time it would take for Chrome to gather enough sunlight as follows. And the precise time was 60 seconds. However, Magma wouldn't stand still for that long. At that moment, Jen appeared and began performing magic tricks to bewitch Magma, making him believe that he wouldn't be able to move for 60 seconds without his heart exploding. Magma tried to complain to the referee, but Senku explained that if Jen was just fooling Magma, there was no rule violation. Jen added that he could only bewitch Magma for 60 seconds and urged Chrome to finish him off quickly. Finally, Chrome managed to focus enough sunlight to burn Magma's clothes. Chrome then knocked Magma down into the ravine, securing the Kingdom of Science's victory. Now, they just needed to pretend to lose so that Chrome could win. Senku and Jinru fought each other, but Jinru thought that Rory wouldn't care about who she married or who became the village chief. He relentlessly attacked Senku, who used a lever to knock Jinru to the ground, making Senku the winner. Next was the match between Senku and Chrome, but Chrome fainted due to exhaustion from his previous fight with Magma. Thus, Senku emerged as the winner, becoming the new village chief and marrying Ruri. However, Senku only needed the alcohol, and since Ruri didn't have much time left, he gathered Keiski and others to continue their work. Senku straightforwardly divorced Ruri. Keiski built a water wolf for Senku, but they didn't yet know what it would be used for. Senku used ammonia to wake Chrome up so that they could get back to work. They began the process of creating sulfonamide, a type of antibiotic. Everyone worked together to ensure they would have the miracle drug by the next day. The following morning, at the water wheel site, Jen realized that it was a device to create carbonated water. He thought Senku was making coca for him, so he happily ran back to the lab. However, Senku also used it to create antibiotics. Finally, after six months, they had the antibiotic they needed. They brought the medicine to the village for Rory to take, but due to village rules, Jen wasn't allowed in. When Jen returned to the lab, Senku had prepared coca for him. It was a combination of cilantro, lemon, and honey. On this side, Senku gave Rory the medicine, earning everyone's trust. He also caught a mouse to experiment on. After examining the mouse, Senku discovered that it had been attacked by a type of bacteria. If Rory had been attacked by this bacteria, she would likely have tuberculosis. After taking the medicine, Rory coughed more. When people rushed over, the village chief attacked Senku, but Kohaku stopped him. Ruri's symptoms were a good sign because they were just normal pneumonia symptoms. The hot water Kohaku brought for Ruri every day helped her hold on until now. Now, Ruri can freely go outside the village after so many years of battling her illness. Starting today, Senku officially becomes the chief of Ishigami village. Surprisingly, Ruri has known all along because Senku's family name is Ishigami. Ruri is the village priestess and the inheritor of 100 stories passed down from generation to generation. The 100th story is named Ishigami Senku. In this story, we can see Senku's childhood through the eyes of his father, Ishigami Byakuya. Even at just 5 years old, Senku was always curious about the world around him. Senku and his father shared a passion for becoming astronauts. Byakuya received an invitation to try out for the astronaut program, but had previously failed the swimming test. Senku, along with Taiju, stole a model from school and worked on creating a suit to help his father pass the swimming test. While it didn't ultimately help Byakuya, the gesture touched him deeply. He shared this story with the recruiters, expressing the shared dream of father and son to become astronauts. In the end, Byakuya was chosen. 
During his time in space with five teammates, they witnessed a mysterious green light enveloping the entire Earth. Their spacecraft lost communication with NASA and Earth when Byakuya accessed the Internet. Everyone panicked when they saw people in stadiums and other places turning to stone. While the others wanted to stay and wait for help, Byakuya insisted on returning to Earth. He believed that with 7 billion people possibly turned to stone, the six of them might be the last remaining humans. They had to save all of humanity. Byakuya wanted to return to Earth, but his friends knew he had a child. Since the spacecraft only had room for three people, they volunteered to go back to Earth in his place. Upon arriving on Earth, the good news was that the three of them were safe, but they found themselves stranded in the middle of the ocean. With only nine hours of backup oxygen remaining. Soon after, Byakuya and the two remaining crew members hurried back to Earth. Byakuya single-handedly rowed a boat across the ocean in search of them. Fortunately, after 10 hours, he managed to find them. The six of them lived together on an island, and two of them even got married. Over time, without science, diseases struck, and without timely treatment, the married couple passed away, leaving their children to Byakuya. The remaining two people wanted to return to the mainland to find medicine and supplies, but they never came back. Only Byakuya and singer Lillian were left with the children of their friends. Byakuya decided to create 100 stories of knowledge to pass on to their future generations, teaching them how to find food, avoid danger, and learn about different types of rocks to stimulate human curiosity. With the conclusion of Byakuya's 100 stories, Ruri led Senku to the village's cemetery, where Byakuya and the village's founders were buried. The 100th story was a message for Senku. Byakuya said that if Senku made it there, he could rest assured that he had lived well. The gift of science that Byakuya left for Senku was the people who carried on the 100 stories. Byakuya believed that once Senku awoke, he would be able to lead humanity back to a scientific civilization. After returning to the village, Jen told his friend about the Tsukasa Empire, saying that they were coming and Tsukasa was preparing an army to attack their village. Since they hadn't found Senku's body, he suspected that Senku was still alive and would find another village to establish a science kingdom. So, Jen came back to warn everyone. Outside the village, Kenru and Jinru were on guard. Kenru noticed someone was spying on them and told Jinru to go back to the village to inform everyone. Kenru was able to handle the situation alone, but the leader of the group was Hyoga, who had recently been revived. If Hyoga and Tsukasa worked together, there was no way they could be defeated. As they were running out, Kenru was stabbed by Hyoga's spear and fell off the bridge, but he managed to grab Hyoga's leg, he instructed Jinru to cut down the bridge so the enemies couldn't cross into the village. However, Jinru couldn't do it because he couldn't indirectly kill his own brother. Senku had to use the remaining medicine for a trick. Jen called for Magma to throw a rock against a cliff to create a gunshot sound, making the enemies think that the Science Kingdom had created guns. Jen then ran out, shouting that the Science Kingdom had guns and telling the enemies to run away. When they all left, Senku and the others came to pull Kenru up. Senku gave Kenru some acetanilide painkillers and applied sulfur to the wound. Hyoga wanted to return to regroup with Tsukasa, but his underlings listened to Jen and decided to wait until it rained to attack, as the rain would render gunpowder ineffective. Senku also made Kenru a pair of glasses, and they began to create their most powerful weapon. Three days later, a storm came, and the enemies returned to attack. Senku stood on the bridge, ready to ignite a grenade, but the wind blew out the flame. The enemies charged and fell into a trap. The weapon Senku created was a Japanese sword, which easily defeated the underlings. However, they weren't strong enough to beat Hyoga, who single-handedly attacked the whole group. Even with Kinru, Kohaku, and Magma charging at him, they couldn't do anything. Kohaku was almost stabbed, but unexpectedly, Hyoga's spear broke in the middle. Earlier, Senku had asked Suika to give Jen a small knife, which Jen used to damage Hyoga's weapon. Hyoga realized that Jen had betrayed him. The attack on the village's outskirts was just a diversion. Hyoga's reliable assistant, Homura, had sneaked into the village and set it on fire. She was agile, making it impossible for anyone to catch her. Everyone immediately evacuated the villagers to Senku's laboratory base. Suika wanted to protect the science kingdom and left to lure the enemies to a cliff where poisonous gas was stored. The wind from the mountaintop was blowing strongly, spreading the toxic gas towards the base of the mountain. Suika ran just as the toxic gas was approaching, but luckily, Kohaku and Senku arrived in time, wearing masks to save her. Hearing that the gas was poisonous, 
Hayoga and his followers climb trees to escape. With the masks, Senku, Kohaku, and Suika safely return to the village. Before leaving, Senku told the enemies that he had created the toxic gas. Unsure if it was true, Hayoga kicked his underlings down to test it. The villagers were rebuilding their homes, knowing that if Tsukasa found out Senku was alive, he would definitely bring an army. Senku wanted to surprise Tsukasa, and they needed to create the strongest scientific weapon in two million years of human history, the mobile phone. It would help them communicate, gather intelligence during battles, and their spies were pre-arranged by Senku, Taiju and Yuzuraha. On Tsukasa's side, after hearing Hyoga's report that Senku was still alive, he became truly furious. The first thing they needed to create was a cotton candy machine. Senku wanted to use the cotton candy machine to create gold wires. After the fire, they had also collected sugar crystals. It was the first time the villagers tasted this kind of candy, making everyone happy. Senku also noticed that Homura was watching them. According to Jen, she was very loyal to Hyoga and would follow them if they evacuated. The elderly in the village wouldn't be able to endure the evacuation. That afternoon, Senku made a cotton candy and a letter for Homura. Senku said his purpose was to show the Tsukasa Empire if anyone there was as loyal as Homura. However, Ruri realized that Senku just wanted to give her some tasty food. The cotton candy making process showed that the fibers were not uniform, and if they made gold wires, the quality would not be good. The reason was that the wire was being pulled in the opposite direction, reducing the spinning speed and causing it to clump. Senku, therefore, created gears from Kohaku's shield. After seeing this, Chrome pulled Keisuke aside to discuss something. With the gold wires ready, they needed to twist them together. Senku wanted a long wire stretching from their location to a distant mountain. After three sleepless days and nights of work, Chrome and Keisuke finally created something and led Senku and the others to see it. A water wheel. Senku was amazed that the two of them, without any knowledge of water wheels, had managed to make one. From now on, they wouldn't need to rely on human power as much because they now had their own hydroelectric power plant. All the electrical energy was leaking, so they needed to create a container to store electrical energy, in other words, a battery. By immersing two lead plates in sulfuric acid, the electric current would flow into them and automatically be stored. Next, Senku created gears with a sawtooth on one side, which would convert rotary motion into back-and-forth translational motion. This device was used to create a bellows to help them fan fires without expending human effort. And then they needed to make light bulbs for illumination. Keisuke mentioned that since Senku's arrival, the villagers had been working harder than ever, but aside from a few people, everyone seemed to be enjoying themselves. The light bulb was completed, and the villagers were called to gather around a large, ancient tree. When the electric light shone, snow began to fall, it was Christmas, and winter had arrived. Chrome, inspired by the light bulb, eagerly wanted to explore caves to find precious stones. In the meantime, Senku attempted to create a vacuum tube light, but he couldn't succeed by the time Chrome returned. When asked what he needed, Senku said it didn't exist in their current era. That night, she wanted to help Senku, so she spent the entire night sorting through the pile of stones that Chrome had brought back. Today was the beginning of the new year, and the villagers gathered to watch the sunrise. As the sun peeked over the horizon, a stone in Suika's hand glowed blue under the influence of the ultraviolet rays from the rising sun. It was a silicate mineral, a key ingredient for making modern-day glass fibers. Three members of the exploration team, Senku, Chrome, and another person, Magma, would go together to mine the silicate ore. Before they left, Jen whispered something to Magma. Chrome was worried because Magma had always held a grudge against them. On this trip, Magma could kill both of them and blame it on an accident. When they approached a mica deposit, which is a type of brittle and easily breakable mineral, Magma rushed forward and struck Senku. However, Magma also fell into a pit. But fortunately, Senku managed to grab his hand. The ground where Senku stood was fragile, so both of them fell into the pit. As Chrome poured water from above, when the cave was filled, the two of them would float up and swim out. Magma said that this era was led by the strong like him, not the weak like Senku. However, Senku explained that in the past, it wasn't the weak who led, and each person had their own role. The development of scientific civilization needed both the weak and the strong for support. Senku showed Chrome how to pump water faster by filling a tube and leading it to a lower point, making water flow continuously upward. Seeing Senku cold in the water, Magma decided not to consider Senku as the village chief. At least until they dealt with Tsukasa. 
magma threw Senku up first. Finally, they found a scar nor, an ore formed when water heated by magma seeped into limestone rocks. All minerals in the hot water infiltrated the surrounding rocks and transformed them into various types of stones. Magma initially planned to attack the two of them while mining, but his plan changed. Senku realized when he fell into the mica pit, Magma wasn't trying to push him down but was actually saving him. Chrome also apologized to Magma for misunderstanding him. Magma remembered Jen's instructions to bring Senku back on the night after three days, so he urged them to return to the village. Close to the village, Magma blindfolded Senku and ran off. Senku thought they would hand him over to Tsukasa in exchange for peace in the village. However, when he opened his eyes, he saw a telescope that Jen and the whole village had made for him because it was Senku's birthday. Since Jen had escaped petrification and saw the number of days Senku had lived, he was extremely amazed. Jen had been very interested in Senku even before they met. The three of them brought back very rare stones, and Senku's plan to create a phone was gradually coming together. They would use the best heat-resistant metal in the universe, Vafarm, which lies beneath the green light. They needed to heat the materials at a temperature of 1000 degrees Celsius. The higher the temperature, the stronger the Volfarm. Volfarm can withstand heat up to 3400 degrees Celsius, while glass can only withstand 700 degrees Celsius. So they needed an extremely accurate heating device. Senku assigned this task to Chrome, while he took responsibility for creating toothpaste using chemistry. Mr. Kaski felt jealous when the two of them worked together since he had always crafted things alone since he was young. However, they both considered Mr. Kaski their partner. To increase the temperature, they needed to create a thin and long valve arm toothpaste strip that would conduct electricity into water to collect hydrogen gas. The hydrogen gas, along with a large amount of heat, would form a layer outside the toothpaste, and finally, they would create a valve arm wire. Next, they planned to make a hitman pump. Mr. Kaski would be in charge of creating vacuum electronic lights. Afterward, they needed to produce plastic. First, they would heat wood with a small fire and boil the solution obtained, then let the copper melt through. Next, they needed to collect a lot of coal. Seeing the villagers suffering from the cold, Senku decided to create an indoor heater to keep everyone warm. Jen was also assigned the task of creating aluminum batteries. A mobile phone device was completed, and Kohaku wondered how they could transmit voices to faraway places. Senku said they needed to make another one. First, they had to test it using a long cable, which would function like a telephone station. At that moment, hearing Chrome's voice coming from the other side amazed everyone. Ruri mentioned that it worked like a speaker. Senku found it strange that Ruri knew what a speaker was, but she said it was in the 14th story of the Hundred Tales. In that story, Birds pecked at tombstones with their beaks, allowing them to speak the voices of the deceased. Surely, something was left behind in Senku's father's tombstone. They ran to the tombstone in the village, and after breaking through the stone layer, they discovered a glass layer wrapped in aluminum. Senku brought it back, used acid to remove the outer aluminum layer, and found that it was a record. The way the record worked was straightforward, it made a needle vibrate with sound, which would then cut grooves, by running the needle over these grooves. The vibrations would recreate the sounds that had been engraved on them. Senku created a record player, and everyone in the village gathered to listen to the messages from those who founded the village. In the message, Byakuya was sure that Senku was the one listening. Even if hundreds or thousands of years passed and he couldn't hear Senku's voice, he wanted to express everything to him. However, he knew Senku didn't like such sentimental things, so he used a song's melody performed by his old friends as a way to encourage the whole village to overcome difficulties together, as everything lay in their hands and they had to keep moving forward. After listening, everyone burst into tears. Although the entertainment born from scientific advancements had disappeared, what mattered was in everyone's hearts. The promise Senku made to Kohaku to create a kingdom of science had become a reality that day. The battle between the kingdom of science and Tsukasa's empire was finally about to begin. A year had passed, and Taiju and Yuzuruha never stopped waiting for the day they could reunite with Senku. The decisive battle was about to commence, marking the beginning of the Stone Wars. Which side will claim victory between the Kingdom of Science and Tsukasa's empire? How will the events unfold? Stay tuned for the next part of Dr. Stone. Today, Senku would create something that would impact their survival and long-term battles, space food. The whole village would work together to make instant ramen. After assigning tasks to the villagers, 
they would start freeze drying and vacuum packing the food to reduce its weight for transport. When the food is placed in a vacuum, the ice inside evaporates, making it dry, hard, and lightweight. Kaski and Chrome even made a vacuum pump using a water wheel. After pouring water into the ramen, everyone praised its delicious taste. In the afternoon, everyone listened to the singing voice of singer Lillian, so that night, Jen went to find Senku. He wanted to imitate Lillian's voice. Although it wouldn't be 100% accurate, if it was transmitted through a device with poor sound quality, people in Tsukasa's empire might believe it. Jen would pretend to be Lillian and say that America was rebuilding, and they would soon come to rescue everyone. Those in Tsukasa's empire would think that there was still hope, and they wouldn't need to serve him anymore. Chrome happened to overhear and wanted to join in. With everything ready, Chrome, Jen, and Magma would bring the device near Tsukasa's residence. Jen would lead Chrome and Magma to Tsukasa's place, and they needed to distract Homura so she wouldn't follow their group of three. Senku would create a sound bomb to lure Homura, using electrolyzed water, and the bubbling of hydrogen and oxygen, which could easily cause an explosion. They would then store the gas in a bladder. They started setting off the bombs to attract Homura's attention, while Chrome, Jen, and Magma would run in the opposite direction. The decisive battle with Tsukasa's empire began, the Stone Wars had commenced. After hearing the explosion, Homura rushed over, as their biggest fear was gunpowder. Kohaku, having determined Homura's location, quickly dashed towards the forest, found Homura, and attacked from behind with her sword. However, Homura sensed the attack and dodged it just in time. Since Homura was a former gymnast, she easily twisted and dodged the strikes. Kohaku was not to be outdone. At that moment, Senku appeared and threw a flashbang grenade towards Homura, blinding her and allowing them to capture her. Since Senku's strength was weak, Homura easily stood up and observed the village from a high point. She noticed Chrome, Magma, and Jen were missing and realized the trio was heading towards their base. Homura immediately pursued them. Senku and Kohaku followed her because Senku had earlier smeared powder from a blue stone onto Homura, making her easier to track. Senku had also created a UV lamp made of nickel and barium mixed with glass, creating a purple light bulb. The phone on Jen's side rang, and Senku signaled to let them know Homura was pursuing them. Jen and Senku used Morse code to communicate with each other. Jen pretended the phone had lost its signal and asked Chrome to climb a tree to check. Hearing this, Homura panicked, realizing they had a communication device in this stone world. She climbed the tree to verify, only to find that it was a ruse. Magma and Kenru simultaneously cut down the tree from below, leaving Homura with no support and causing her to fall. Senku called for Kohaku to catch her, and they successfully captured Homura. Jen, Chrome, and Magma reached Sukasa's empire, where many stone statues were numbered, waiting to be revived. Sukasa had revived 32 people. Magma wanted to destroy the statues, but just as he was about to swing his axe, Jen stopped him, explaining that they were not all bad people. The group went to a tomb, which was Senku's tomb, created by Taiju and Yuzuraha. They planned to place the phone there, which would also serve as a meeting point for Taiju and Yuzuraha to receive news from Senku. On Sukasa's side, there was a person with exceptional hearing, and Jen's group almost got discovered. The phone was placed at the enemy base, and Taiju and Yuzuraha received it. After a long time, they could finally talk to each other. Senku asked Taiju and Yuzuraha to give the phone to someone within Tsukasa's empire so they could listen in. Without hesitation, Taiju just wanted Senku to confirm that this was the best way to minimize damage. After hearing Senku's confirmation, Taiju agreed without asking for any reasons. The mutual trust between the two impressed everyone around them. Meanwhile, Jen's group was being pursued by Tsukasa's sharp-eared member, Ukyo. Magma came up with a plan to let Chrome run out and attract attention, then act as a shield for Magma to punch away the pursuer. To ensure the plan's success, Chrome threw a battery to ignite the grass and started shouting. Magma also ran out, yelling loudly to attract Tukio's attention and give Jen a chance to escape. The sacrifices of Chrome and Magma helped Jen return to Senku in time. On Taiju's side, they called a guard named Nikki to listen to the phone. Jen would pretend to be Lillian, and Senku would act as the interpreter. Together, they would try to deceive Nikki into believing that Lillian was with them. As Lillian was an American, they claimed that the United States was working to restore the world from the petrification era and would soon come to rescue Japan. Nikki was a diehard fan of Lillian, and she asked them several questions to test their authenticity. She asked about the number of records Lillian had sold. 
Senku estimated it to be around 60 million, based on her revenue and concert tours, which was the correct answer. The next question was about Lillian's body measurements. Senku recalled the photo his father had sent from the satellite, with the measurements 88 65 85. However, as an avid fan, Nikki knew Lillian would never reveal her true measurements to the public. So she realized the person on the other end of the line was not Lillian. Seeing that deception was not working, Senku played a recording of Lillian's voice for Nikki to hear. After listening, Nikki realized that Lillian was no longer there, and Senku confirmed it. In the past, Lillian's music had saved Nikki's life. Senku promised to use science to protect Lillian's final song, and in the end, Nikki agreed to join their plan. Nikki stated that their plan to imitate Lillian's voice was only 55% accurate. On Sakasa's side, there was a person with incredibly sharp hearing named Ukyo, who was a sonar operator for submarines. Chrome and magma were surrounded by Ukyo, even though it was difficult to see through the thick smoke. Ukyo only fired arrows to threaten them without causing any harm. Chrome realized that Ukyo wanted to capture them alive for information, so he decided to surrender and let Magma escape. Magma ran back to inform everyone that Chrome had been captured. Kohaku wanted to go and rescue Chrome, but everyone stopped her as she wouldn't be able to do it alone. Senku took a megaphone and announced that it was time for the Kingdom of Science to launch a full-scale attack to rescue Chrome. Everyone prepared various items to set up a camp near Tsukasa's empire. Since there were too many items to transport, Senku decided to create a car to facilitate the transportation process. Meanwhile, Chrome was not afraid even when facing Tsukasa. Tsukasa took him to the edge of a waterfall to extract information, threatening that Chrome had to bring Senku's head in exchange for the freedom to practice science and the safety of the villagers. However, Chrome refused and told them to let him fall. Hyoga released Chrome, but Tsukasa knew that they wouldn't get any information from him, so he ordered Ukyo to shoot an arrow to save Chrome. Since they couldn't extract information from Chrome, they had to guess where Chrome had been. Ukyo knew exactly where Chrome had been but told Sakasa that Chrome had gone alone and found him at the miraculous cave where they found nitric acid. On Senku's side, they successfully created the steam engine. Senku's steam engine was powerful enough to easily push magma away. Since the steam engine created vibrations, Senku needed to create different wheels. Wheels made of bamboo were developed, using airless tires invented by NASA for planetary exploration. The steam-powered car was completed. However, the village elders did not want to slow down the progress of the others and decided to stay behind in the village. Everyone said their goodbyes to the village elders and children. As the car still faced difficulties going uphill, Senku prepared to create something else. The villagers set up camp on a hill close to the enemy base. While Kohaku was scouting Chrome's location, Suika sneaked into the enemy territory for reconnaissance. Chrome spotted Suika and made a commotion to get attention. The little girl returned to report the situation to everyone. Senku decided to directly attack the enemy base with a paper tank. He asked everyone to gather grass, then boiled it with Nao. After boiling, the grass became sticky, and when cleaned and crushed, it turned into paper. They attached it to a frame, but Kenru easily pierced it with a spear, so he didn't trust these paper shields to be strong enough. Senku and Kenru had a contest to see if the shield or the spear was stronger, and Kenru's spear broke. The reason the paper shield was strong was because of a layer of melted plastic combined with a flexible paper. Creating carbon fiber. The paper tank was completed. Near Chrome's prison, there were sharp traps in front of the jail. Tsukasa had anticipated that Senku would create a steam engine to attack, so he prepared traps as a defense. Tsukasa had also anticipated that Senku would use scientific weapons to rescue Chrome, so he set traps and revived Yo a former police officer skilled with a baton. Chrome tried various ways to escape, but the prison was made of earth and stone, so he couldn't cut the ropes to get out. He asked the guards to let him go to the bathroom, and fortunately, they agreed. He began gathering items around him, but when he returned, all he had collected were some wild grass and a few dry branches. That night, while sleeping, someone threw a battery into Chrome's cell. He quickly burned it on the ropes binding the fence but this caused the guards to rush in and beat him up. Fortunately, they didn't find the battery, thinking he had started the fire with the branches. They mocked Chrome, saying that he was a scientist who only knew so little. Chrome remembered when Senku conducted an experiment to electrolyze seawater to obtain sodium hydroxide. He created salt water by continuously exercising to make his clothes soak up sweat and wringing them into a container. By morning, 
he had a full container. He then used the battery for electrolysis and poured the solution onto the ropes binding the fence, which allowed him to break the gate. Chrome also shouted that there was a bear in the cell to mislead them, then he escaped through the back door. Chrome managed to avoid all the traps and only Yo was able to chase him. At the edge of a waterfall, Chrome turned to fight Yo, but Yo struck him in the face with a baton. Blood flowed from Chrome's mouth like a stream. He said he had pneumonia and didn't tell anyone because he didn't want them to worry since it was contagious. Chrome continuously coughed blood on Yo, scaring him. Taking advantage of the situation, Chrome hit Yo's lower body with a bamboo stick and ran away. Kohaku was observing through a telescope when she saw Chrome returning. Everyone rejoiced and praised him for escaping the prison on his own. Taijun Yuzuraha successfully recruited some of Tsukasa's followers to their side. Due to their frequent gatherings, Ukyo discovered their activities. He wanted to hear Lillian's voice, but even though Lillian's diehard fan Nikki had coached her voice, Ukyo still detected a flaw when her voice didn't tremble after singing. But Ukyo spoke in English, and Sanku suddenly understood and replied in English as well. He was sure that the person who smuggled the battery to Chrome was Ukyo. He had also discovered the secret mission Senku had assigned to Yuzuraha, which was to reassemble the petrified fragments that Sakasai had broken. This deeply moved Ukyo, as he didn't want to see anyone die before his eyes. Ukyo set a condition for their collaboration, that no one must die, and Senku agreed. Through their conversation, Ukyo realized that the followers who had previously gone to Senku's village had died at the hands of Hyoga and Homura, not Senku. On Senku's side, their tank was complete. Senku used electrolysis of water, where hydrogen and oxygen would make an explosive plate expand to the maximum when ignited, creating a gunshot-like sound. Taiju and Yuzuraha also reunited with everyone. The Kingdom of Science had enough resources, and the decisive battle with Tsukasa's empire was about to begin. On the other hand, Tsukasa and Hyoga reached Senku's grave and discovered the buried cell phone. Senku and the others arrived at the Miracle Cave. The steam-powered gorilla weapon attacked. When the cannonball hit its target, the jar would break, mixing the fuel like alcohol and charcoal with sulfuric acid, creating a massive explosion. Taiju, with his superhuman strength, took the lead, carrying a sturdy carbon shield. They rushed forward, neutralizing the enemy's weapons, but there were still many enemies blocking the entrance to the cave. Senku's tank had also been overturned. Senku called for magma to hold a copper battle pan. Their next weapon was a sound bomb using a recording device to absorb the explosion's noise and overwhelm the enemy. Outside, the reporter and the enemies planning to escape and informed Sakasa were stopped by Ukyo, Nikki, and their allied soldiers. Now, they had nitric acid and began to create bombs. They had enough resources like coal and sulfur, but Ukyo couldn't have imagined that Sakasa and Hyoga would arrive so quickly. Ukyo shouted a warning to everyone, but he was hit by a spear from Hyoga. Hyoga suggested that Senku should die to protect the remaining people, but now Senku had Taiju and everyone in the Kingdom of Science and their allies present. They were ready to hold off the enemies, allowing the scientists to create weapons. The real battle had begun. Kohaku, Kinru, and the others kept their distance and surrounded Tsukasa and Hyoga. Tsukasa immediately leapt high into the air, while Hyoga spun his spear in a circle to lock up their arms and neutralize their weapons. As Tsukasa was suspended in midair, Nikki wanted to use the pan to create a sound wave attack, but Tsukasa threw his spear, pushing all three of them against a tree trunk. Meanwhile, Chrome had found residual sulfuric acid in the spent shells. Now they could combine it with glycerin soap to create explosives. Inside the cave, Senku created nitroglycerin, a single drop could cause a massive explosion. Tsukasa charged towards Taiju at the entrance of the cave. Suddenly, a paper airplane was launched, and when it collided with a tree, it created a huge explosion. So Senku successfully created an explosive and attached it to a paper airplane folded by General they weren't worried because paper airplanes were hard to hit accurately. At that moment, Ukyo stood up and said that explosive arrows would be more precise. This forced Tsukasa's soldiers to surrender. Senku wanted to negotiate with Tsukasa. Senku realized that although Tsukasa hated those in power, he had previously fought battles to earn money from them. Senku knew Tsukasa's sister was not dead but in a coma. And although their family had given up, Tsukasa had been determined since childhood to train and compete to earn money for her treatment. Senku told Tsukasa that they could use the revival fluid to save his sister, and there was a chance she would be cured of her illness due to the petrification process, as Senku had previously been saved from death by it. 
a ceasefire agreement was reached. And everyone went to the location of Tsukasa's sister to save her. On the way, Tsukasa explained his ideals, if Senku now revived everyone, would the resources of this era be enough to meet everyone's needs, and could the world accommodate them all? When they arrived, Senku used a bomb to destroy the surrounding land, everyone dug together, and they finally found the petrified statue of Tsukasa's sister. Senku poured the revival fluid on Mirai, and everyone watched the petrification reversal process together, hoping for a miracle like Senku's previous resurrection. Finally, it was successful, and the girl could walk and recognize her brother. Tsukasa was moved, hugging his sister tightly after thousands of years apart, even though she had previously been brain dead. Crow noticed that the remaining small pieces didn't match, and Ukyo said that if someone had stolen them, his ears would have heard it. The only person who could deceive his hearing and steal the items was Homura. That night, Yo appeared and saw Homura, who asked him to tell Hyoga that it was time to rescue her and execute Hyoga's plan. Suddenly, a loud noise erupted at the Miracle Cave, causing the cave containing nitric acid to collapse. The one responsible for this was none other than Homura, and she wouldn't have acted without instructions. Senku realized who was behind everything and sensed the danger. He immediately ran to Tsukasa, who was with his sister and Hyoga near a lake, hearing the explosion. As Tsukasa was about to investigate, Senku yelled for Tsukasa and Mirai to run away. Hyoga aimed his spinning spear at Mirai, but Tsukasa blocked it, getting impaled through the chest and pushed off the waterfall. Senku tried to grab Tsukasa's hand, but both were shoved down the waterfall by Hyoga, who followed them. They washed ashore on a nearby piece of land. Hyoga knew the water's course and was already there. He pursued Tsukasa's direction but with a more negative approach. Wanting to overthrow Tsukasa and have sole decision-making power, Tsukasa wanted the young to live peacefully together, while Hyoga valued talented individuals, believing that young and useless people would become robbers in the future. He wanted to team up with Senku to become the strongest duo and threatened Senku by scratching his finger. Insinuating that if Senku didn't cooperate, he would lose each finger. However, Senku refused, continually kicking rocks at Hyoga and reviving some petrified birds with the revival fluid to block Hyoga's view. After Senku managed to stop Tsukasa's bleeding for a while, he was able to stand up and fight back against Hyoga. Promising not to let Senku be in danger again. The two teamed up to battle Hyoga, with Tsukasa fighting him barehanded. Meanwhile, Senku spread explosives outside, and Tsukasa lured Hyoga into the trap. Flames shot at Hyoga, but he used his coat to smother the fire. He attacked Senku, leaving him motionless. Tsukasa tried to resist but fell due to his severe injury, holding tightly onto the spear to prevent it from piercing his neck. As the two struggled, Senku wasn't injured because he had a high-strength zinc carbon plate inside him, which blocked Hyoga's attack. Hyoga was hit with a powerful electric shock, and right after that, Senku and Tsukasa high-fived to celebrate their successful collaboration. Homura planned to help but was captured by Kohaku's group. Senku decided to imprison the two of them until civilization was rebuilt. Finally, the kingdom of science truly began, with both sides working together to rebuild the kingdom. Yuzuraha's mission succeeded, though missing a few pieces, but upon pouring the revival fluid, they still restored people to normal. Despite his severe injuries, Tsukasa still revealed all the locations where he had destroyed statues and never forgot anyone he had killed. His efforts were to atone for the sins he committed in the past. Taiju promised to find and collect all the broken pieces. Senku created many formulas but could only make an adhesive to help stop Tsukasa's bleeding, as Senku was not a wizard who could heal damaged internal organs. The only way for Senku to save Tsukasa was to petrify him. But they needed time to research the origin and process of petrification. Therefore, Senku would personally kill Tsukasa first, then cryogenically freeze him, putting him into a state of hibernation. For Senku, this was the only way to save Tsukasa. Everyone worked together to build a refrigerator. Tsukasa was happy to hear Senku's group chatting and working together. The refrigerator for cryogenically freezing Tsukasa was completed. Everyone went outside to give Senku and Tsukasa some privacy, as no one wanted to witness a friend killing another friend. It was also their last private moment to talk. Senku tried to bring up random topics, talking about various things. It was the first time Senku felt truly powerless. Tsukasa said that the time spent working together with everyone was the happiest he had ever been. And Tsukasa passed away, Senku kept talking even though he knew Tsukasa was gone. His sister Mirai would take the time to care for her brother like he used to care for her. 
Yakuya left information that the petrification ray appeared on the other side of the earth, so a new mission and journey began, building a ship and crossing the ocean, what new things await them ahead, what is the mystery behind the petrification phenomenon in that light, and can they save their friend Tsukasa? All this will be in Season 3, so let's look forward to the next part of Dr. Stone together. Kohaku and the others performed a play, recounting the tale of the mysterious green light. One day, thousands of years ago, a strange glow enveloped the earth, turning everyone into stone, and toppling the civilization humans had built. However, there was one boy who kept counting, the seconds through, the years to retain his consciousness. After his revival, he and Taiju set about rebuilding civilization from scratch. They tirelessly experimented, and eventually, they succeeded in dissolving the stone layer. After their battle with Tsukasa, they continued to unravel the mystery of the green light. The performance boosted everyone's morale. And next, they planned to build a ship to cross the other side of the ocean. But first, we need a design. Jen has set up a competition for everyone to take part in. But only three contestants came up with a design, which were Senku, Yo, and Magma. Yo was very confident about his design, and claimed that he had finished it a long time ago. He even looked down on Magma, but when he saw Magma's design, he was very surprised, and dared not to show his shoddy design. And the winner of that brainstorming competition turned out to be, Senku, with a perfect and magnificent design. Keisuke and Chrome were worried that their forces weren't enough, and that constructing the ship might take hundreds of years. But Senku said their science team would join forces with those, Tsukasa had previously revived. Senku then went to Minami to ask her to find a ship captain, someone who would take them, to the other side of the earth. Following Minami's guidance, they traveled to an island, and excavated a stone statue. Minami warned them not to choose a person named Ryusui, who was a hedonistic heir of the Minami family. As a child, Ryusui had numerous models of ships and bottles, and eventually built a real sailboat, roaming around for middle school. Upon hearing that Senku decided to revive Ryusui, he quickly grasped that civilization had been wiped out with his sailor's intuition upon revival. They returned to their shipbuilding site, where Ryusui instructed them to pack up and cover the ship. His sailor's intuition was spot on, as the temperature was rising by 14 degrees, humidity was at 90 percent, and a southwest wind was blowing due to the air mass from the Changjiang River, indicating an impending spring storm. Soon after, a storm hit. To cross the other side of the earth, they needed a fuel, which is crude oil. Chrome, Kohaku, and Ukyo were tasked with finding an oil field. Ryusui said that once they found an oil field, he would claim it as his reward as the captain, and they would have to buy oil from him if needed. Following this, he began issuing his own currency, and Sanku didn't object to it. Over on Chrome's team, Ukyo heard the sound of a flowing stream. Kohaku climbed a tree to pinpoint the location, and they ran towards it. Ukyo remarked that there wasn't such a large waterfall here 3,700 years ago. They reported the situation to Senku's team, who explained that Mount Fuji had erupted massively, changing the landscape. During the 3,700 years they were petrified, there were at least 4 to 5 eruptions, and at most 10. They needed a more detailed map. Upon seeing a flock of birds, Little Suika mentioned how great it would be, if they could ride a bird for a bird's eye view. This sparked an idea in Senku. He then asked them to collect oil thorns. Jen appeared, and told them that if they couldn't find oil, exchanging Drago for oil would be meaningless. He showed them a way to prevent, their stack of Drago from becoming worthless. Shortly after, they helped Sanku collect a large amount of oil thorns. Jen manipulated the market to help them gather oil thorns. Sanku decided to create a hot air balloon for a bird's eye view, essentially launching an attack from the sky. After hearing Sanku say they were going to fly, everyone was skeptical. Senku planned to use the oil, thorn cloth to make a hot air balloon. He asked Yuzuraha's craft team to sew the cloth. First, they needed to grind, and fluff the oil thorns. Then, Yuzuraha taught them her craft lesson. They took the fluffed oil thorn fibers, tied the fibers to a spindle, and then twisted and spun them. Next, to create cloth, they stretched a few threads like a musical instrument, and weaved up and down. However, as this method would never finish in a reasonable time, Yuzuraha asked Senku's science team to create a loom. Yuzuraha's craft team was exhausted, and some cloths were too thin to hold enough air. Seeing this, Jen went to the idlers in the cave, and announced a spinning contest, with the winner receiving 10,000 Drago. 
they would sell the cloths with many holes as products, creating a Senku trade center. That night, the fashion show took place, with the admiring eyes of beauty enthusiasts below the grandstand. The next day, our group sold a lot of clothes, particularly to Ryusui, the biggest buyer. After many days of hard work, our team finally completed the hot air balloon. Next, they needed to choose three people to go up. The first was Senku, who understood the mechanism. The second person needed to be able to read the wind direction. If they directly asked Ryusui, he would charge them, so Jen came up with the idea of drawing lots. There were two joker cards, and whoever drew them would go. Everyone took turns drawing. When it was Ryusui's turn, Jen intentionally handed him a card, but it wasn't a joker. Psychologically, people regret most when they lose, what they think they already have. Immediately after, Jen pulled out a joker card, and said he had drawn it but didn't want to go up, in the hot air balloon. Seeing this, Ryusui offered to replace Jen, and paid him a large amount of money. Then, Chrome ran up, also wanting to draw, and he drew a joker card. That night, they prepared to fly. Everyone in the village, was very surprised to see them flying in the sky. From up high, they would see the sunrise 7 minutes, earlier than the people on the ground. Chrome burst into tears, as he wanted to know everything about this world. They were headed to Ishigami village. They planned to use the low pressure wind to move counterclockwise, utilizing it to travel westward. Unexpectedly, a storm cloud appeared, forcing them to ascend several thousand meters high in the sky. They decided to accelerate straight ahead, and burst through the storm cloud using a solution made from a mixture of alcohol, and nitric acid, a highly combustible fuel. Eventually, they successfully escaped the storm cloud, and made it back to Ishigami village. Ukyo called Jen to inform him that, Senku's team had returned to the village. Everyone was excited, because they had managed to reach the village in just a few hours. Senku and Chrome brought Ryusui back to the village, where Ryusui noticed that everyone looked like Chrome, and Kohaku, descendants of people who lived here hundreds of years ago. Ryusui wondered how Senku could have been revived, if he was the one making the revival potion. Chrome explained that Senku continuously counted the seconds while being petrified, and was revived by nitric acid dripping on him. Kohaku and Ukyo then took Ryusui on a tour of the village. Kohaku explained that to fight against Sakasa, Senku gathered allies in this village, and created a kingdom of science. Now, Senku wants to go to the source of the petrification beam to rescue Sakasa. They need a ship's captain like Ryusui for this task. That night, the villagers held a welcome party for Ryusui, but he was very disappointed, because all they had was fish. It's hard to get food because there are only two village guards. The next morning, they began their search for an oil field. First, they would map out the area from the sky. From above, they spotted a forest of fir trees, and down below. After a day, they had marked all the spots on the map, and the only remaining likely location was the Sagara oil field. The villagers were amazed, as it was their first time seeing such a detailed map. The next day, as they departed, the villagers came to bid them farewell. Ryusui learned that the reason the population couldn't grow was due to a lack of food. Kohaku also told him that the village used to be bustling, but a year of poor hunting had caused many deaths. Senka believed that foraging, and hunting couldn't provide enough food, they needed agriculture. Ryusui pledged to find seeds to help the villagers. From above, Kohaku spotted wheat. She rushed to harvest it, and bring it back to the village. They began to thresh the wheat to obtain the seeds. Senku mentioned that it would be difficult to cultivate in the mountainous village, so he took the seeds to Taiju. On their side, they were repairing the broken statues. Magma wondered why they couldn't just revive everyone to help with the work, but if they revived everyone, there wouldn't be enough food for all. Kohaku appeared, and said they didn't have to depend on nature anymore but instead would use intelligence, and strength to produce food. Taiju was enthusiastic about digging, but Magma and Yo didn't want to work, so Jen came up with an idea. He suggested using Yuzuroha's newly made hat as a crown for the person, who grows the most food. Magma and Yo went crazy digging the ground. That night, everyone else rested, but Taiju continued to work. Since his parents died when he was young, he wanted to do everything to revive everyone's families. After a while, Taiju's wheat sprouted vigorously. Senku showed them how to test the soil. He used crushed morning glory flowers to make paper, and obtained litmus paper. When dipped in the soil, if the paper turned purple, 
the soil had enough nutrients, if it turned red, the soil was acidic. They neutralized the acid in the soil by adding lime, and seashells. After a time, the wheat ripened, and the human food problem was solved. They could now fly out into the world to seek the truth about the petrification, and revive everyone. They tried the bread that Senku made, but it was burned black, leaving Ryusui helpless. He wanted to revive a chef, but Senku said the revival fluid had run out, and they couldn't revive anyone else. Ryusui claimed he knew someone who was secretly hoarding the fluid. He called journalist Minami, who would be deciding who would be revived next, and would surely keep some of the fluid for herself, to revive someone she wanted. Jen appeared and suggested that Senku would make a great gift for Minami, if she agreed to hand over some of the revival fluid. Minami agreed. Ryusui wanted to revive a person named Francois, a butler and chef. After being revived, Francois went to find Ryusui. Upon reunion, Ryusui handed over the bread they had made. Francois scoffed at their effort. Then immediately got to work. Francois asked Senku about his food requirements, and he said they needed a type of food, that could be preserved for 10 months. After some thought, Francois decided to make Stalin bread using goat milk. They began making the bread. Senku understood why Francois made sweet bread, in butter, dried fruit, and sugar. All the moisture would be absorbed, leaving no water for bacteria to multiply, so it wouldn't spoil. Francois told Ryusui, that she wanted to revive the Nanami Corporation, and she needed someone like Senko to help. After eating Francois bread, everyone in the village praised it endlessly. Then, it was time for Francois bread making class. They put water and salt into flour, kneaded it, and let it rest for an hour. They shaped the dough into a round shape, let it rest for another hour, and then baked it at a temperature of 200 to 300 degrees. Minami called Senko asking him to make something for her. Senku agreed and enlisted the help of the artisan Keiski. Soon after, a car carrying Keiski and Minami arrived. Keiski would do the crafting, while Senku and Chrome would take care of the scientific part. Using sodium hydroxide, silver, and ammonia, they created a mixture. They then dipped a piece of glass into it, and added some sugar to create a mirror. However, what Minami needed wasn't a mirror, but something for her job as a journalist. Senku then placed the mirror inside the device Keiski had created, the first camera was born. Minami was deeply moved seeing the camera, she promised to capture the process of civilization's development from scratch. But soon after, Senku pulled out a bunch of cameras so they could do aerial surveys. Taking aerial photographs, and conducting observations was overseen by Senku, and Ryusui. While on the ground, Chrome and Ukyo were in charge. Senku said they had to capture everything before winter came, as once the snow fell, they wouldn't be able to see anything. Thanks to the aerial photographs taken by Senku, they hadn't found the oil fields yet, but they had discovered many sources of raw materials. The next dish Francois made at Senku's, request was black pudding, a dish that could store protein. Francois invited a forest expert, Little Suica, to help. Through her observation, they found a wild boar. Kohaku discovered a dark spot. When Senku came closer to look, he found that it was the Sagara oil field. The villagers started to venture into the forest to search for it. On the other side, Francois and Suika used the wild boar to search for truffle mushrooms. However, as soon as the boar found them, it ate them. Suika let her dog, Chalk, look for them, and it soon found them. Over on Senku's side, they hadn't found the oil field yet. After some contemplation, Senku remembered the story of the discovery of the Sagara oil field in, 1827. Humans had used wild boars to locate oil Sagara. Just as Francois was about to butcher the boar, Senku and the others quickly intervened to stop her. Thanks to the boar, Senku's group found the Sagara oil field. Next, Senku created a steamboat using a Stirling engine to test the oil. This engine had previously been used to freeze Tsukasa. They set off for the sea. Senku planned to create a GPS, a location tracking device that uses signals from artificial satellites, commonly used in phones or cars. Earlier, Senku had created a very strong electrical signal from a lighthouse on land. By adjusting the direction of the antenna, they could determine the distance and intensity of the electric wave from land, Rory called them. In their first call earlier, Chrome was too shy to confess his feelings to Rory, so Reinru wanted Rory to be proactive and confess first. 
Just as Rory was about to say something, an unexpected noise interrupted the call. Ukyo recognized that it was not just noise, but someone sending them a message. Jen suggested that it could be Morse code, a message sent to them. Senku realized it was from the person, who had petrified all of humanity. To summarize the story from the beginning. One day, all of humanity turned into stone, something that science at the time couldn't accomplish. During Senku's self-liberation from the stone, 3,700 years passed. All of them suspected that the person behind this was Y Men. Ryusui wondered if that person had also turned themselves into stone. They didn't know where he came from or who he was. Senku stated they could see him through the eye of science. First, they used sphalerite stone found in mineral caves, crushed it into powder, dissolved it in water, and poured it into a triangular flask. After settling, they obtained fluorescent paint. Once they turned on the switch, it acted like a vacuum tube. Accelerated by the electrode, electrons were fired due to the heat. When the electron beam hit the bottom of the triangular flask, the fluorescent paint caused that point to light up, and that was the display screen. By moving the beam to create those dots, they could form an image. That's how old TVs worked. Then, they passed an electric current through a crystal, causing it to vibrate. Run between two plates of glass, the electronic wave was neatly bent. Connecting the antenna to the two glass plates created radar. If they replaced the antenna input with a microphone, it would create an undersea sound wave locator, which could also be used as a fish finder. Soon after, they caught a big haul of fish. They returned to the village with a massive load of fish. Ukyo was worried that the power output of the radar was not enough. Senku stated that they would equip the boat with a multitude of engines. To advance into the industrial age, they needed a large amount of metal and oil. However, the iron at the river bank was running low. On the other hand, Chrome was thinking of a way to use the radar to detect metal. He connected a metal wire coil to the radar screen, and brought it close to the ore pile, and there was a signal. Chrome ran to the hill where Kohaku and Sanku had previously harvested lightning. Inside the cave, the radar detected movement under the ground. Soon after, Sanku and others arrived. The thing that Chrome found using science was iron ore. However, they couldn't transport the massive amount of iron. Jan and Ukyo tried to transport iron using a cart, but the rough terrain prevented them from moving. Ahead, Senku and others were paving a road. He used 90% of the road building material, which was gravel. Senku utilized surplus oil to make asphalt, mixed the asphalt with gravel, poured it on the ground, and then flattened it. Following this, they transported it by water. Inside the cave, Craftsman Keiski created a car to easily transport the minerals outside. The transportation system of the Kingdom of Science was completed. Just when they thought the boat was complete, Craftsman Keiski stated that the hull was increasingly skewed and about to break. Senku decided to abandon this large ship and switch to a smaller boat that could only carry a few people. Ryusui recalled his childhood as a young master. When his father had cut his pocket money to just 1 million a month to teach him to save. However, Ryusui found a way to increase his capital. He invested his money in the stock market, and entered contests to win money. The elders in the family said Ryusui was extravagant, and dissipated, but Francois stated that Ryusui was not indulging in decadence, but immersed in his passion for making sailboats. Back to the present. Ryusui stated he would make a large sailboat. He planned to enlarge that model accurately, and he and Senku would create it at a 148 scale. Reporter Minami would document the process of building the world's first steamship. Senku disassembled Ryusui's model ship, then enlarged and copied each part. He used a 50 kg pen to enlarge it, a method the Nazca region used for their geoglyphs. The boat building process was now half complete, it was just a matter of time until it was finished. Finally, their steamship was completed. Minami wanted everyone to take a photo together with the ship, because it would be the last time they would be together for a year. The sailing team, and those staying behind would have to say goodbye, possibly not seeing each other again. Senku stated that this wouldn't be their final moment. He was 10 million percent sure he would solve the mystery of the petrification, and return from the other side of the earth. As Minami was in charge of taking the photo, she wouldn't be in the frame. Anticipating this, Francois had the craftsman make a timer for the camera. On September 10, 5741 AD, their steam sailing ship, the Perseus, was completed. The team decided to split into two groups. One group would adventure into the world. 
seeking the solution to the petrification, while the remaining group would stay behind to further human development. Ryusui had also made a list of sailors, calling out names of those mentally prepared to step onto the ship. The first names called were those of the engineers, Senku, Chrome, Keisuke, Yuzuruha, the sail engineer, radar and sonar operator, Ukyo, the cook, Francois, and the labor group, which included Kinru, Jinru, and Kohaku. There was a fear that if all the strong ones were on the ship, the imprisoned Hyoga, and Homura might break out of jail, and take over Japan. So, Senku decided to move the jail to the ship, anticipating a time when they would become their strongest card in the deck. The last one to board the ship was Jen, who initially feared his lack of physical strength would be a hindrance. However, Senku reassured him that they would need a psychologist to assist, so Jen also embarked. Senku declared that they were headed to Treasure Island, the place where his father's spaceship, the Soyuz, had landed. This was the resting place of the only group of astronauts, who had escaped the petrifying light, and the origin of a hundred mysterious tales. 3,700 years ago, a few years after humanity was turned to stone, Byakuya left precious gems inside glass jars, which he then placed in a treasure chest. They would wait for the day when the scientists of the future would appear. Senku asked Rory to tell him about the 100 stories, that were passed down in the village's knowledge. However, he could only make it through 8 stories before he collapsed. Senku wanted to hear the story about the gemstones, as most of the village's names are based on these. Kohaku, for example, means, amber, which is a clear, sun-colored gemstone. Kin, means gold, a glittering sand sleeping in the treasure chest. Diamond is a very hard, very shiny, and clear gemstone in the treasure chest. Platinum is an ultra-rare material, rarer than gold, but a small piece can produce a mass production revival drug. Jen pointed out that the maximum number of people, that a human brain can remember in a group is about 150. Tsukasa's empire had about 100 people, and Ishigami village had more than 40. Together, that's around 150 people. If they were to increase this number, it could cause instability, and fragmentation within the group. However, if they have platinum, they won't have to worry about the limits of revival anymore. Platinum, also known as white gold, glitters with the color of the moon. It is this very platinum that was left in the treasure chest on the Soyuz spacecraft. Jen mentioned that a member of their physical strength team, wanted to talk about something important after hearing their conversation. He revealed that he wasn't from Ishigami village. As a child, he was alone, and washed up on the beach. A villager found and adopted him. Because his real name would stand out too much in Ishigami village, he has lived under the name, Nameless. His real name is, Soyuz, and he can guide them to his homeland, where the treasure chest lies. Ruri speculated that these people might be distant relatives of the Ishigami village, their descendants having become tribes living on the island. Ryusui hypothesized that many people have crossed the sea to Japan, and then stayed, leading to the formation of Ishigami village. This would explain how Ruri's ancestors knew about the 100 stories left by Senku's father. They also theorized that the people on the island could be the Y man, but Ukyo pointed out that the island's resources are very limited, so it is uncertain whether they could develop a saturated electric wave civilization. Ryusui stated that if they had such powerful scientific capabilities, they couldn't hide forever on that isolated island. The desire to see the whole world, and understand it is an irresistible human instinct. Soyuz also wanted to know who his companions were, if he was the only one not from the village. He tried multiple times to venture out to sea using his sparse memories, but was always thwarted by storms. Senku said that Soyuz's curiosity is the driving force behind science, and that Soyuz is also a part of the kingdom of science. Yuzuruha expressed her interest in the structure of the ship, so Senku, Ryusui, and Keisuke led her on a tour. They began with the stairs, explaining that if one grabs the rail from top to bottom, they would fall when the ship sways. Next, they showed the sleeping quarters with its five-tier bunk beds, and many intricately curved parts. They also had a look at the radar GPS antenna, the Eye of Science, which was located in the information room. To prevent accidents, the windows were made just large enough for a person, to squeeze through in case of emergency. They also explored the engine room, and a mobile research room situated on a trailer, which could be moved to land. As some crew members were experiencing seasickness, Senku decided to make a drug similar to scopolamine, to quickly suppress the autonomic nerves. The ingredient for this was the belladonna flower. 
a highly toxic plant. By separating the plant's water-soluble and oil-soluble components, they could extract the elements needed for the medicine. Just a small amount would be sufficient, but misuse could lead to fatal consequences. The sea's weather is notoriously unpredictable, and a storm came suddenly. This, however, was an excellent opportunity. They were facing the island's inhabitants, who could be either friends or foes. If they could navigate through the storm without being detected by the islanders, they could approach them using their scientific knowledge. Everyone began to take their positions as the final island appeared before them. To make their reconnaissance undetected, a scouting party composed of Senku, Kohaku, Jen, and Soryu's planned to go to the island. At this point, Ukyo detected something under the water. Rinaru, following orders, plunged into the sea to inspect, finding many stone statues down below. Ukyo recognized that when the petrification beam fell, the island was uninhabited, and people only started living there later. The question then was, since when had these people been petrified? Ryusui noticed that someone was watching them. When Jen's team looked back at their ship, they found that everyone on board had been turned to stone. Suika didn't understand what had happened, only remembering that Ryusui had kicked her off the ship to avoid being petrified. Upon hearing the news, Kohaku wanted to rush over there, but Jen, anticipating this, grabbed her to prevent her from running. He suspected that the enemy might still be nearby. Soryu's recalled that he had seen the same light once when he was a child. The group continued their search to quickly locate platinum to save everyone. Senku used cyanoacrylate, boiled it, and put a seashell in the steam. Under UV light, they detected a fingerprint. Senku speculated that it belonged to a woman who had recently passed by. As they followed the tracks, they encountered a girl named Amaryllis. The people in her village were planning to rebel against the chief, who would come each year to kidnap girls for his harem. To control the situation, Senku's team used tear gas bullets. Amaryllis, seeing this for the first time, thought it was magic. Upon hearing their intention to save their petrified friends on the ship, Amaryllis revealed that she knew the secret behind the petrification beam. To rescue everyone, she wanted to become the number one beauty on the island, to uncover the mystery of petrification. Five years ago, when Amaryllis was 13, she and her friends and sisters set out to explore the ocean. Ignoring the elders in the village who warned them that they would be turned to stone, by the chief's magic if they left the island. As soon as they had gone a certain distance, the chief's right and left hands, Mozu and Kirisame, pursued them. Kirisame started to throw something into the sky, which surprisingly turned out to be the petrification beam. Amaryllis' siblings shielded her, but when the petrification beam touched her hair, she tore it off and the beam stopped. It appeared that this beam was of the same type, as the petrification beam from thousands of years ago, just differing in scale. If it was a power of someone, they couldn't do anything, but if it was a weapon, it could be stolen. To investigate the petrification beam, Kohaku would participate in the selection competition the next day. Simply changing outfits wasn't enough, Senku wanted to create something. First, they needed to recover the mobile laboratory on the ship. The leader Zebra and Kirisame had arrived on the ship to investigate, and there were things that even Kirisame didn't know what they were, this was the first time she had seen them. But now Kirisame was standing in front of Kohaku, attacking her. However, because she was hindered by her outfit, she couldn't fight back. Thinking that there was still someone on the ship, Kohaku shouted just need land, with the intention that the survivor on the ship could hear, and help them. The people here didn't understand what Lad was, so to fool Kirisame. Jen said that Lad was Senku's name, and that they were dating. This managed to deceive Kirisame. A few days earlier, Ukyo's arrows could only deviate a bit, seeing this, Ryusui kicked Suika off the ship, hoping that she would survive, and inform Senku. Jinru, who was underwater, saw a strange light, and had also dived deeper, so he was fortunate enough to escape. After Senku's group found out Jinru was still alive, they were powerless. Fortunately, they still had one expert in disguise, the young girl Suika, who was still alive. Little Suika quickly disguised the laboratory, then created a diversion for Jinru to start the engine, and then dived into the water, and ran straight to the island. The islanders thought it was a beast running away. To avoid the crowd, Senku used rotten meat and a shell combined with jasmine, then heated it to create the smell of feces. Then, they quickly started the engine and escaped. They hid in a cave, and started to create shampoo, 
conditioner, and makeup for Kohaku. Believing that more candidates would improve their chances, Amaryllis disguised the male members of the group as females, and in the end, Jinra was chosen to participate. The selection process began, and due to her adorable appearance, Amaryllis was selected. Mozu discovered Kohaku's combat abilities, but he did not expose her, however, he indicated he would intervene, if Kohaku intended to destroy the harem. Kohaku was selected. And despite Jinru's attempts to avoid being chosen, he was ultimately selected. From this point, the three of them would begin their infiltration of the enemy's base. The mission to steal the petrification beam officially began. Senku created a spy device to transmit instructions, and they successfully delivered the device to Kohaku by throwing it down from a cliff. Now, they divided into two teams, the spy team and the science team. The spy team's mission was to observe, and separate Kirisame, and when she threw the petrification beam, the science team would steal it. What Senku wanted to create on this island was a drone. First, they needed to have an electric motor, by winding copper wire around a piece of iron, and passing electricity through it. This created an electromagnet. To create a super strong electromagnet, they needed to wind thousands of rounds of wire for all the copper wire they had. The spy team arrived at the chief's village. At this point, Amaryllis distracted the guard's attention to allow Kohako to look around, where she discovered the key to science. Over on Senku's side, they created a remote-controlled mouse motor for communication. Since it was shaped like a mouse, it didn't attract much attention. However, none of the three could write, so Kohaku had to draw a code to provide information for Senku's team. The science team received the code, and tried to analyze what Kohaku wanted to tell them. Eventually, Senku's team interpreted that Kohaku wanted to say that the Platinum was here. As night fell, Kohaku went to inspect the spaceship, but it was covered by a layer of concrete. If this was destroyed, it would alert the enemy. To avoid attracting attention, Senku would create a silent bomb. By combining a green liquid with a white powder, they would create gypsum. The necessary ingredients were delivered to the spy team, by the remote-controlled mice. Amaryllis and Jinra would distract the enemy, while Kohaku would go to the treasure mirror. She would drill a few holes, and then put in a white tube containing anhydrous calcium sulfate, and a tube of green liquid, which is sulfuric acid. When these two mixtures combined, they would create gypsum. When it expands, the holes inside are small, and the gypsum has no place to escape. This would create a tremendous pressure of 300 kg cm2, and explode from the inside. That night, Kohaku arrived at the treasure mirror to inspect it. With just a slight touch, it broke, revealing the gift that Senku's father, Byakuya, had left for him. However, due to the rough handling, Kohaku accidentally broke the contents of the bottle, causing a stir that attracted the attention of the guards. She quickly gathered the broken pieces, and handed them over to Senku. Byakuya had dedicated his entire life to collecting rare materials from streams for Senku, resulting in a large quantity of platinum inside the bottle. Until his last moments, he held in his hands the treasure of humanity. Now, the development of a machine that could produce an infinite revival fluid was in progress. Meanwhile, Eber's people discovered the intrusion by the spy team. In the end, Senku successfully created nitric acid, which could revive all members of the Kingdom of Science from petrification. On this starting island, the final battle to seize the petrification beam officially began. Will Senku's team be able to seize the petrification beam, and save everyone? What will happen next? Let's look forward to the next part of the anime Dr. Stone. That wraps up all three seasons of the anime series Dr. Stone. Make sure to subscribe to Anime Kingdom to stay tuned for other great anime series. Bye bye.